as well. So having said that, let's dive into the fireside chat. I have my good friend, Krishna Penyala, and we are going to have a nice informal discussion about how do you find balance in a world of extreme uncertainty. Now, if you don't know Krishna, I mean, Krishna has, uh, it feels like Krishna has done it all. He's currently the founder and chief empowerment officer at Choice Ladder. He previously worked uh, with Congressman Ryan at the Mindful Nation Foundation, uh, ranging from education to veterans into healthcare and, and how do we bring awareness and mindfulness into different sectors of the workforce. He's had a very diverse career from founding two technology companies to then being a COO and coach at, at a financial firm. And as a side note, he's also an IIT graduate, which means Krishna is extremely smart. He will never say that because he's too humble, but he also is, 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 is incredibly sharp. And so anyways, all that to say, we're excited to bring him into our event. We're excited to have you here. Uh, Krishna, if you want to turn on your video, we can see that beautiful bookshelf behind you. We can see you. Hey, how, you, how are you doing, Krishna? Awesome, David. Always enjoyed being with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I know we, we caught up recently and there, there's, um, you, you always get a story from everywhere you go, right? Every time I talk to you, we catch up. I say, what's new? You have a story and you're somebody that is so observant and, and, and you just uh, uh, experience so much. The last time we talked, you said, oh, you won't believe what happened at my recent trip. It was just four days ago. You went to the lake. Um, t tell us what happened. First of all, uh, David, you've been such a delightful person in my life. So I want to acknowledge that. And I am in the same room where you and I worked for several years. So this is a good homecoming for me with you. So congratulations for launching Jetpack, the work you do, and so on. So welcome to everybody. We're kicking this off. And when David called me about balance, first of all, to blow your bubble, David, achieving balance is close to impossible. So what can we do instead is really what I'm going to talk about. But since you asked me about the story, I think stories are always useful to make points. So this was last Saturday, and my wife and I were supposed to be in Bali, but obviously Bali ended up to be out of range. So we drove two hours to race down Lake. And we were having, there was just one restaurant, and we were having dinner outside. It was around 6.45. And we were close to the exhaust fan of the restaurant, so we couldn't hear much but there was another couple sitting about 10 feet away. And suddenly both of them get up and dart towards the exit. And that's kind of odd when you, everybody's eating dinner. There's only three tables. They just got up. In, and in 2020, you don't want to see anybody dart anywhere. Exactly. So I wonder what happened. And curiosity got perked. And then you said I was observant, but I wasn't that day until I saw them running. That was the trigger. And once I heard, saw them running, I started to say, what's going on? And I could hear a faint voice. Help, help, can anyone hear me? Help, help, can anyone hear me? And boy, I've never heard that in my life, but I think that is the theme for 2020. Whether we hear it or not, I think a lot of us are going through that statement in our head, help, help, can anyone hear me? So I told my wife, somebody's in trouble. Can I go and see if they need more help than these two people? She said, sure. So I ran over and we were in a cove, but the voice was coming from the other side, which means the only way to get there is to swim or to run around. And this gentleman had a head start on me. So he'd already reached that boat. And this person obviously seemed to be in the water flailing and screaming for help. So... I asked his wife, do I need to go? She said, no, I think he got him. So I just stayed with her to make sure everything was copacetic and came back to my table. The two of them came back a few minutes ago later. And once we finished dinner, I walked up to him and said, what happened? And this is what he said. He said there was a gentleman working on his boat, a twin engine boat. He had taken off the lid of the motor and was working on it, leaning on a railing. And every aspect of this has metaphors that you can apply to life. We lean on railings for support and the railing broke and he fell into the water. So that's what happened. And he was screaming for help, help, help. Can anyone hear me? But then comes the question, what choices did he have while he was in the water? And he said he was holding on to that lid the, of the motor 
and it had filled up with water, which means it became too heavy that he couldn't get out. So I asked this gentleman, could he have let it go? And he said he wouldn't. And those are some of the choices that we have, letting it go. I mean, if you could think rationally in that moment, you could let it go. It's in a cove. I doubt the depth of the water is a whole lot, which means the next morning he could have gotten it. That was one option. The second one is he could have emptied it, which means it would have been a lot lighter and maybe even become a flotation device for him to hang on to. So neither option were exercised when people are in panic. So the model of that story is don't lean on railings that you don't know. <laughs> Number two is when you're in panic, most likely your reason, power of reasoning is out the window. So with that, 2020 has been like that almost the entire year. So what can we do? And all my workshops, I've always started with the first comment about the acronym VUCA. And David, you know, I love ac acronyms. So VUCA is another one, which I didn't come up with, but it's been around for a long time. VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I always used to say, we are living in VUCA times. But add the pandemic in 2020 and the other unrest that we are dealing with, we are VUCA on steroids. And living in that world, those, that context keeps us on high alert all the time, which means we are depleting a whole bunch of energy much more than we probably even realize. We don't have a gas gauge to tell how much energy we have. We don't have a gauge to tell us how much attention we can pay. So energy and attention, most of us, again, in productivity circles are big into time management. And so that's the only, and we have a calendar, which is an incredible gauge for how we use our time, but we don't have gauges for measuring our energy or our level of attention. And I would argue if you don't have the energy when you wake up in the morning and you have a full calendar and a busy day, how well do you think that day is going to go? Number two, if you can't pay attention to something, how can you make the right choices? So those are the kinds of things that come up. But this gentleman, so panic is one. When you're in panic, the first thing you got to kind of do is, you know, about flight or fight or flight. And if you use just your fist as your brain, and this is your prefrontal cortex, when you, so to speak, flip your lid, it's an, your amygdala or your brainstem is doing all the work, which is fight, fight, flight, or freeze. And so the only way you can make a good choice is to wait, take a, take a time out so that your prefrontal cortex is back online. So I, I, I love that story for the, I mean, so many metaphors in there, but how do you successfully unplug? Right. I, I know we talked a little bit about this in the past, but you know, if you're, if you're so overstimulated in 2020 that you are prone to make poor decisions and the way to combat that is to, you know, give yourself a little bit of space to re-energize. Uh, it feels like there's so many pitfalls, right? Like, like, like Netflix, not necessarily re-energizing, but we love it. You know, our phones are not necessarily re-energizing, but we love it. And I feel like there's all these kind of dopamine traps that we could fall into because we say, oh, we need a break. So I'm going to open up my phone, but that's not, that's not doing it. So um, how do you kind of, you know, if you're running down this lane, how do you pick your head up and, and consciously go into a different direction? That's an incredible question. Uh, the way I do it, at least, especially post uh, in the COVID era, I have actually gotten rid of my uh, devices. I've shut off all notifications. I go look at it only when I want to and weekends they're totally off simply because that's the only way I can limit. Think of it as our mind is what we are trying to protect. So we lock our doors, we, we pay money for services like Guardian and ADT to keep people out of our homes. What do we do to keep things out of getting into our head? So it's almost like creating some security devices or methods that restrict what you let enter your mind because your mind is on overdrive right now. So you use the word unplug. So unplugging can be done in many ways. And in my workshops, I give them a break and you are going to be giving breaks today. But I'm so surprised that the definition of break has been bastardized so much. 
So most often when, pe- when we give someone a break, what do they do? They jump to check their notifications, their email, their voicemail. So is it really a break? No, it's just a switch. And that's what you're really talking about. Going from A to B is not a break. Going uh, or getting an escape is not a break. You want to give your mind a break. When you sleep, you give your body a rest, but you may not really rest your mind, especially high achievers who, who I'm focused with. As you know, we call, I call lovingly call them driven and restless. So driven and restless folks, are all their mind is racing most of the time. And even when they go to bed, they're thinking about problems and they wake up next morning. Many times they even solve the problem in their sleep. So actually they keep repeating that, which means they are denying them their mind of the rest. And you know, I like metaphors. So think of it like a car. When a car runs out of gas, there's a gauge that tells you and a light lights up and then you fill gas. That's like food to the body. But an oil change is more insidious. You can't see it. And especially the old cars did not even tell you when the oil change was. We relied on that little sticker on the top left of your windshield to remind you at a particular mileage, you need to go get your oil change. And the person who made, did the oil change would put update that sticker for you. It's almost like that. You need that sticker in your life to remind you when to unplug. And an oil change is much like giving your mind the break rather and not just taking care of your body. I love it. I love it too. Um, Cause I know there's, there's so much content we could go into. We only have seven minutes left. And so I want to make sure that we transition a little bit to um, life spaces. I know it's something you think a lot about and it does deal with balance and it does deal with energy uh, because you know, where we operate in could be depleted if we hedge too much in one area over the other. Uh, and so I'm curious, you know, we, we all have so many different roles, right? You could be a spouse, a parent, a peer, a boss, a manager, uh, son or daughter. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. And so in a world in which, you know, we, we certainly need to take breaks, but we're operating in so many different spaces. How do you, how do you balance that? How do you reconcile that? You know, if I were to use, you know, you know, terms, no, you know, our community might say, now. you can't use that word yet. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so let's stick with balance, right? I mean, people have realized work-life balance is a non-starter, right? I mean, just do the simple math. As a recovering engineer, I can't help but use math. I mean, if you sleep six to eight hours and if you work 10 to 12 hours, especially high achievers, including your commute, there's very little left for life. So that whole construct of dividing it into two parts, work and life, simply doesn't work. And that's why in my book, I divided life into six life spaces, yourself, your partner, your friends, which includes relatives and community, your work, your money, and your kids. And those who don't have kids, I've seen them replace in my exercises with pets or parents or whatever else they want to. So these six life spaces are what you are trying to interact with sometimes on a daily basis. And if your goal is balance, like you said, it's close to impossible to do it. So my approach is to look at each of these spaces and we have an exercise, by the way, it was ready just this morning. My developer finished it just for your members, uh, David. So I'm really happy to share it. Where you score your life in these six life spaces, yourself, your partner, your uh, friends, your work, your money, and your kids. And then you look at how well you're doing. And then you can see, do you want to make a change? And if so, how would you do it? Adding more work on yourself is not the answer. So the key word there is, and especially since most of your people are accountants, I'm going to use the distinction between balancing versus reconciling. Reconciling is means you make a choice and you live with it. It's a conscious choice. And the way that works in life spaces is you can choose the time period, right? In accounting, you might say, I want to reconcile balance or reconcile my books uh, every so often. And you can define that time period. In life spaces, you can do the same, but it can be a different time period for each life space. For yourself, you may want to reconcile over a couple days. If it is with your young kids like James, you want to check in on him on an hourly basis. But if you have kids like mine who are teenagers, they don't want to be checked in, period, right? So the time period over which you check in, your work, could be checked on a weekly basis. Your money could be checked on a annual basis if you have a good uh, financial advisor. 
if, and if you're uh, disciplined, your friendships, your social engagements could be reconciled over a quarterly period. You might say, I want to have six uh, social engagements a quarter. But if most people try to balance it in a, every aspect on the same time frame, and that causes the challenge. So that's the simplest way I think you can consciously choose. And then I had one CEO who ranked friends as six and gave himself an F. And he said, I have five kids, two homes, darting between two cities. I don't have time for friends. But I still think when he goes to his beach home, the number of friends he meets over a quarter could quite well meet his um, objective for how many social engagements he wants. So I want to give that room to change the time period to do over which you check how well you're doing. And that gives you a lot of room to accomplish what you want. Yeah, what I, what I enjoy about this so much is that you're, you're consciously designing and you can consciously tweak depending on how you're feeling about the life space design. So if you try to do, you know, in your terms, quarterly reconciliation uh, and you want to see how you're doing with your, your friends and you're like, you know, I was trying to do six, I did zero or I did 20, but I did 20 and I couldn't do A, B and C, I could, you know, kids, what have you. I think what's powerful about this is just being conscious about the things you want to participate in, how often you want to participate in them. And, and what are the what are the demands of certain life spaces? So uh, because I think, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in the in the day to day that you're just like, oh, goodness, I haven't seen call it my friends in a while. Mm -hmm. And you and you lean too heavy in that way because you've you've so depleted that part of your life space that then you become mad at yourself. You might miss certain things, you know, what have you. So I think this is a very nice way to be conscious about the way you want to operate throughout your life. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I've seen it work for me because I think the pressure we have on ourselves is already too much. So adding more is not an, a great idea. So actually giving yourself room and space to really perform the way you want, giving, I mean, really, I mean, deadlines. I hate that word deadlines, because, but we get work done. And uh, the reason is the root of deadline is dead. I mean, I don't know anybody who walks up to a pregnant woman and asks, what's the deadline for your baby? <laughs> you know, uh, that would be really awkward. But you say, what's the due date? Because due date has a much softer touch to it than deadline. So motivation can come from fear or from a sense of fulfillment and accomplishment. And one is what I refer to is as bad fuel and good fuel. So good fuel burns clean, bad fuels leaves stuff inside that you don't see until it's quite later, because the crud, so to speak, uh, and a uh, car is a great metaphor, you use bad fuel, you're still going to make it to your destination. It just over time, you're going to have extra uh, junk in your engine. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Krishna, this has been a real treat. Uh, somebody asked, what is the name of your book? And I was going to look over my shoulder, I'll probably break my little green screen by doing so. But can you briefly uh, talk about, you know, what's the name of your book? And then we have the the um, opt-in if people want to learn more as well. So I'll go ahead and reshare my screen while I do so if you want to tell people the, the book title. The, my book is called Beyond the Pig and the Ape, where pig and ape are uh, acronyms for pursuing instant gratification, and the ape stands for avoiding painful experiences. And if you don't acknowledge and watch their behavior, they will run your life. So that's the book. But more importantly, Right now, one of the way to, uh, since you're depleting yourself quite a bit, you want to replete yourself. And the way to replete yourself is to boost your immune system. So if you want access, I have some pretty cool, simple ways to boost your immune system. It's an infographic. If you want to get the infographic and also the way to score your life, which, got, which is a little online uh, exercise that you can do literally in two minutes or less, uh, go ahead and please text uh, the word VALUES in all caps to 33777, and it'll be in your uh, inbox uh, momentarily. Awesome. If anybody has any more questions for Krishna, about Krishna, put them in the chat. We'll follow up. We'll link up to some of the resources he mentioned. Hey, Krishna, thanks for coming on and helping us kick off this event. Thanks, David. Good luck to everyone. Enjoy the rest.